Okay, good. So you're the hardcore. You stuck around to the end. Well done. So what I'm going to talk about is naming. And you're thinking, how on earth can I talk about naming of variables, methods, and classes for 90 minutes? My feeling is, how could I not? I've actually had to cut out a whole load of slides and topics. So I don't actually be spending a lot of time on uh, variables, for example, and field names and things like that. So I'm going to go mostly for types and methods. Uh, things that are relevant. Um, things that are relevant, I need a new picture. I've been using that one for years. Uh, they got my name on the cover. That's kind of relevant because it's software related. Also kind of relevant. And also another picture I need to get a new one of. Um, I don't just do software stuff. I do, I, I write a bit of short fiction. And I've, had, I've been published in a number of places. And why is this relevant? Well, it turns out this book's nothing to do with me. Um, but there's a quote from Doug Crockford that um, gives us the crossover. It turns out that style matters in programming for the same reason that it matters in writing. It makes for better reading. <coughs> uh, but I'm going to go a bit further than that. It's not just a, a quality of reading experience. It actually um, has a profound impact. Uh, I, I noted in the blurb uh, that I uh, gave for this talk that the, when you are communicating, when you are writing code, you are, you've only got really three significant things that you use in your communication. Names, spacing, and punctuation. Programming languages are quite picky about punctua punctuation, so you don't get a lot of latitude with that. Maybe the extra parenthesis here and there, but not a lot. Indentation, there are enough conventions. I mean, there's certainly a lot to be said, because what we do is we organize things visually. We group things that we would like to be considered together, and we separate things that we'd like to be considered apart. Um, I will say that programmers are pretty bad at spacing. They just think it's the default indentation setting on their IDE. Now, there's an awful lot more to spacing than that. But that's not this talk. The most significant use of visual bandwidth is in the names. And we're sometimes very casual with that. And I, this, this is one of my favorite programming books, um, Small Talk Best Practice Patterns by Kent Beck. <clears throat> it's, just a, it's a very well-written book, as well as having good advice. So it, so it hits on two levels. Its structure and its content and its style um, really bring out the core messages. And he spends a bit of time talking about naming. And one of the areas, he, one of the points he, he mentions, um, in addition to talking about intention-revealing names, he says, you know, people will be using the words you choose in their conversation for the next 20 years. And he's focusing on classes, and particularly the roots of class hierarchies. Yeah, you want to be sure you do it right. You are, you're not just labeling pieces of code. You're not just identifying, using identifiers. You're actually creating a vocabulary. And people will use that vocabulary outside the code. That's how else are they going to talk about it? So you're creating, a, a, effectively, um, a system of thinking, it turns out. Problem is, as he notes, unfortunately, many people get all formal. Just calling it what it is isn't enough. So this is from a client of mine about a year ago. Public interface condition checker, Boolean check condition. Or it's based on something from a client of mine. Um, dot, dot, dot. Obviously, if there's nothing in the dot, 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 then we can you know, uh, use appropriate lambdas and stuff like that. But there's this idea of... <laughs> This is fairly normal naming convention. You know, the use of the prefix check, the idea that I've got to tell the reader about the interface, it's a checker, it's a this, it's a that, it's a whatever. And I remember asking the question, well, hang on, what, what, what is, you know, I looked at some of the subclasses, what, what is this, I, what's represented here? What is this? And eventually I came to the conclusion, I said, what you mean is that this is not a condition checker, it's a condition. And conditions are either true or false. If you have, so you just get this, you get this code because people are very, very procedural in their approach. And, you know, yeah, check this, check that. You're not checking. Is it or isn't it? Yeah, there's a there's a directness to the name that is missing. You, we add checker and we've added nothing except more letters. Okay. Now this is not a particularly large example. You carry this to its logical extreme and you get enterprise code. So. As Kant notes, they have to tack on a flowery, computer science-y, impressive sounding, but ultimately meaningless word, like object, thing, component, part, manager, entity, or item. 
And this is just a subset. And let me just point out, this was in 1997, 18 years ago. Okay. A lot of people think, oh, it's a recent trend. No, really, he, Kent was relying on his experience in the 80s and 90s. And I saw these trends as well. Uh, uh, and it's a case of whenever you put object on the end of something, it's like, well, of course it's an object. The, you, know, you don't have to explain to the reader um, that this is an object-oriented language or that we are dealing with objects and so on. So I will say that I don't see thing very often. That doesn't sound technical enough. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, if you want to impress your colleagues, you up it to an, uh, entity or something like that. Uh, but I've certainly seen object and manager. Oh dear, you see, there's a, there's a lot. I used to advocate the manager pattern, but that's because I understood how to apply it, um, or I thought I did. But now I've seen people misapply it so much, I'm very, very, very cautious. It does have a role, it's just not the one people uh, use it for. So the simple, the punchy, the easily remember will be far more effective in the long run than some long name that says it all, but in such a way that no one wants to say it at all. And there is an interesting pendulum swing that has occurred. You know, say, 20 years ago, I spent my time trying to convince people that they should use longer names, because you know, this is still at the tail end of the great vowel shortage of the 1970s and 80s, where apparently there was a worldwide scarcity of such things. And we see this uh, all over the place. It's just like, there is a name. No, rip out the vowels. There's a shortage of that. <sighs> there we go. But now, people have overcompensated. The pendulum swung all the way to the other extremes. And now, you, you know, this is, everything just gets elaborated and further and further and further. And if you haven't told somebody it's an object, perhaps you should tell them it's an object. So I want to pick on this observation from Dick Gabriel. Actually, around the same time, maybe published this around the same time that Kent's book was published. He talked about the habitability of code. Habitability is an aspect of code that we often overlook. It's um, a missing element of the, of the architecture uh, metaphor. When we talk about architecture, we normally think about structure and purpose and things like that. But in any building, there's another quality. Actually, it is also true of code. It's the characteristic of source code that enables programmers and people coming to the code later in its life to understand its construction and intentions. This is really important. You, how do you understand somebody's intentions? Well, you, this, is, this is where uh, words come in. This is how you are trying to communicate to somebody else. You're trying to give them a mental model. You're trying to place inside their head a way of working with the code. And you're not going to do that with just a bit of spacing and a bit of punctuation. This is where the words matter. Um, and often people overlook this because they're so busy focused on the task in hand, which is very natural, uh, that's a human thing, um, that they forget that actually what they're trying to do is create a model. So what you're doing when you write code is trying to project a model uh, into somebody else's head. This is how we're working with this. This is how we want you to think about it. These words indicate the architecture and the way to extend the architecture and modify the architecture. That's what you're doing. You may not have thought about it like that, but that is actually what's happening. So, uh, so you end up being able to change it comfort uh, comfortably and comfortably. It also has this consequence of making a place livable, like home, which is what you want to feel in the code base. You want to feel comfortable. Um, and if you end up, you know, I remember first, uh, one of the first code bases that I ever worked on um, in commercial code, I remember the exciting discovery that there were a couple of main flags in the system that went by the imaginative, imaginative names of flag one and flag two. I mean, you know, it's one of those moments your heart sinks. It's just like, okay, and what is it that flag one and flag two represent? Other than flag one was the first flag I thought of and flag two was the second. You can tell that from the names, yeah? But it turns out that that's kind of like trivia. That's not helpful. That doesn't really reveal intention. That just reveals accidental sequencing. So what we need is to improve the signal-to-noise ratio. This is going to make our lives easier. Okay? We talk about signal-to-noise ratio as a, as a, a technical uh, term, the level of a desired signal to the level of background noise. But we use it most often informally. We talk about it as the ratio of useful information to false or irrelevant data in a conversation or exchange. That's what you're doing in your code. You've got a conversation or exchange. That's what you're doing. Now, sometimes I like to joke, you know, you know it's uh, Shakespeare, one of the more famous pieces. To be or not to be, that is the question. Oh, it's great stuff. 
On the other hand, if we write this in kind of like modern enterprise speak, it looks like this. Continuing existence or cessation of existence, those are the scenarios. Is it more empowering mentally to work towards an accommodation of the downsizing is a negative? Well, you see, we've used longer words, we've used more of them, we must be, we must be really communicating at this point. It turns out the communication is not a, it's not a question of quantity, it's a question of quality. Now, I have more recently started to joke, you know what, actually programmers wouldn't write that. They'd write it like this. Um, but, <laughs> but my views on indentation I will leave to another talk. So. I'm talking about words, and when we talk about words, a lot of people say, oh, no, no, Kevin, you, you're wrong. It's not just three things. It's not just the three things you mentioned. The spacing, the punctuation, and the names. There's comments as well. And how do we use comments? Do we use them wisely? Do we use them appropriately? Well, I'm not going to pick on Oracle, but I'm going to pick on Oracle. But actually, no, I'm not going to pick on Oracle because this is representative of a surprisingly large class uh, of comments. There's a huge, great banner there. What is this banner for? It's for hello world, for heaven's sakes. This, uh, this dwarfs the coat. It's a one-liner, and we have got this huge, great, you know, please don't use this in a nuclear power station type of rights message up the front. We get rid of that. And it's like, oh. But I do love the fact that it's the rather grandiose, the hello world app. Come on. It's not an app. Implements an application that simply prints hello world to standard output. Man, that's actually a longer explanation than the code. And this is Java, and the code's already long. So, so then we get down to the code. But there's still one comment. Display the string. Well, that helped. I'm glad they put that there. <laughs> you know, my life is better as it. But you know, this is the interesting thing for all of this noise. And it is quite impressive noise. There's one thing they've got wrong and it's in the code. For all of that, they missed out a comma. We put a comma there. Yeah, they, they did all of this, all of that, and the one thing that actually relates to something real that somebody will observe is the missing comma. If you're not sure about this one, there's a kind of like a, a fairly famous one that does the rounds. There's a fairly famous meme. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, let's eat, grandma. Let's eat grandma. Good punctuation saves lives, OK? There is a big difference between those two. So one job, one job, and they screwed it up. OK, so let's try something else. Around the time I was learning C, just, uh, uh, Rob Pike, uh, kind of one of the Unix demigods, um, wrote this rather good um, notes on programming in C. It was written in 1989. And, uh, and, and I, I think I got to read it around 1991. And I think, and this is, there's some good advice there. There's some slightly dated advice. Um, and there's some relatively timeless advice. Um, comments. A delicate matter requiring taste and judgment. I tend to err on the side of eliminating comments for several reasons. First, if the code is clear and uses good type names and variable names, it should explain itself. Second, comments aren't checked by the compiler. Ah, oh, yes. They're not checked by, by programmers either, it turns out. So there is no guarantee they're right especially after the code is modified. A misleading comment can be very confusing. Third, the issue of typography. Comments clutter code. They, they create a noise level. But I think my favorite, my favorite piece on comments in his, uh, uh, in his paper was this one. It's a famously bad comment style. I because I just want to add one to I. And there are worse ways to do it. And this huge great banner statement, add one to I. Don't laugh now. Wait until you see it in real life. You know what? I laughed. Five years later. Five years later, I saw pretty, I'm not exactly the same indentation, but this example in a, in a piece of code in a bank. That bank went out of business six months later. Coincidence? I don't know. <laughs> so, you know, here's the problem. Is, you know, the, going back to the late 70s, a very influential book, uh, The Elements of Programming Style, um, so I got recently accused of my, my views, on, uh, uh, views on comments. I'm, I'm not a no comments guy. I'm a just like, really, you need to cut back on them uh, kind of guy. Um, and uh, use them sparingly type of guy. But somebody said, oh, you know, it's just so trendy to not do comments. And I said, no, really, actually, this is the book that I read that gave me my, my views. Um, if a program is incorrect, it matters little what the documentation says. Here, documentation is referring to in-code documentation. Uh, this is a good point. 
Um, if documentation does not agree with the code, it is not worth much. In fact, I would say it is of negative value. It's not simply not worth an awful lot. Actually, you now have two stories the code is telling you. The one that's the real one, which is the code, and then a different story which you might be seduced into believing, but is actually, it's, it's basic journalism, okay? It's all lies, okay? Three, consequently, code must largely document itself if it cannot rewrite the code rather than increase supplementary documentation. Good code needs fewer comments than bad code does. If you take one bullet point away, number three, that is the one that you want. It's a, it's a profound insight. Okay, rewrite it so I don't need the explanation. What would I want to communicate to somebody? So there's the, there's the key idea. Comments should provide additional information. They should never parrot the code. Mnemonic variable names and labels and so on should emphasize logical structure, help make a program self-documenting. However, I do put, a, I do put a, a sort of a buffer or barrier of caution on that. Sometimes it's all too easy to say, ah, oh, the code's self-documenting. Which self made that judgment? Probably the self that wrote it. You need another self to make the judgment. Yeah, it's not really your judgment to make that it's self-documenting. Show it to somebody else. Yeah, that, that's, 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 uh, this is where we get social with the code. But there is this idea of there is a lack of guidance on this, and so therefore comments lose. Comments are a little bit like um, gold in the sense that their value derives from their scarcity. Gold's value derives from its scarcity. It's not worth as much per kilogram as something like iron. Iron is surprisingly common on this planet, so therefore we don't charge as much for it as we do gold. Gold, part of its value derives from its scarcity. And you want that with your comments. They should be gold. And they should, when you see a comment, it's just like, this is worth pausing for and reading. In other words, it tells me something that is non-obvious. So there's also another thing that came out. <laughs> There's a, a tweet of mine that seems to have got retweeted rather a lot. Common fallacy is to assume authors of incomprehensible code will somehow be able to express themselves lucidly and clearly in comments. And sometimes people say, oh, yeah, yeah, I like using comments to explain what I've done in the code. OK, so why did you not do that in the code? And what manner of explanation are you going to offer? I'm going to say writing clearly is hard. It is non-trivial. OK, and I, I say that with my fiction author hat on and my technical author hat on. And I think I've kind of got the hang of writing, maybe. And I've been doing some form of writing since, I don't know, primary school or something like that. And so a few decades, and I think I might have got the hang of it, but I'm not entirely sure. Ask me again in 10 years, and I'll probably have a different view. It's non-trivial to do this. And if you're struggling to express yourself in one written format, which actually gives you the appropriate bandwidth uh, uh, to explain yourself in, then I don't rate your chances very highly elsewhere. So this leads us into the code itself, the names that are within the code that are significant to the compiler. Uh, an example I'm very fond of using um, comes originally from Philippe Calçado about mm, six years ago. The idea of using tag clouds. I, lo I love this approach. Um, and he did this uh, it's from his original article. He took a Java code base. Um, he stripped out all the comments, stripped out all the string literals. Um, and in this particular case, he made it case insensitive and just you know, shoved it into a tag cloud generator. And um, this is what he got. So you can say it's a Java system, but we can't really say much about it. I mean, it's got strings, it's got lists, and it's got integers. But that's kind of it. And there's, I'm going to, I'm going to. Put a, I don't know what the system does. Actually, there is one clue there, but I don't know what the system does, but I'm going to put a fair amount of money down that somebody did not. There's no customer out there who said, what we need is a system that handles strings. That's what we need. It's going to handle strings, and we want to use lists and integers as well, just to be sure. But mostly, it's about strings. And so we have a stringly type system here. Now, I'm sure it does lots of worthwhile stuff, but the problem here is that I want to go back to this idea. There's a conceptual model that you have in your head of how you're approaching something. And between here and here, sometimes it gets kind of translated down. You end up with a sort of object-oriented assembler. So the model gets broken down into constituent parts. And although the thing that runs, runs, and makes sense at the level that it's been pitched, it's kind of like we're missing out all those really great ideas that help you organize your thinking. Philippe also offered an alternative. He showed a different system. And here we see a much richer vocabulary. 
and I can't tell you exactly what it does, but you know, printing device, paper, picture, product, the language of the domain is, is very richly woven into the code. These are class names. These tell us what we're looking at. Okay, they tell us something about the code. In fact, this is a minor point. You can actually see the class keyword here is larger than in the previous code base. There are more types. There's probably about as much code, but the code is organized into different units that have meaning, and they are, uh, they are described, described as such. So that kind of takes us into this idea, um, as, as Dan North um, wrote in code, uh, code in the Language of the Domain, that the names matter. But it's not just about abbreviations, and it's not just about being explicit. Because if we look at this, if portfolio IDs by trader ID dot get trader dot get ID dot contains key portfolio dot get ID, if you look at that, there is only one abbreviation in there, and that's ID, and that's not a programmer abbreviation. That's a real world abbreviation. We use the, uh, the, the, that that abbreviation quite commonly in the real world, and yet it's not clear what this does, except that it's a lookup of a map of maps. And we might say, well, perhaps a comment would help. No. How can I rewrite the code to obviate the need for a comment? Ah, well, that changes it. All of that code is still there, but that notion of explanation has gone in to the code and has meaning. Can view, trader can view portfolio. Oh, right, OK, so this is actually to prevent insider dealing. Now, if you want to comment, you might refer to the appropriate legislation, which is not obvious in the code, but we're no longer telling people this is what this condition is trying to say. It's trying to say that we're trying to check whether or not the trader can view the portfolio. Well, in which case, stop trying to hit me and hit me. Refactor. Just that's the name of the thing. So refactoring is not simply a case of um, this class is too big. It's, a, it's a, an act of explanation. You know, we, if you've got an expression or a block of stuff and you want to put a comment over it, well, maybe, maybe we've got a, already got a construct for that. In other words, a method or a function or something appropriate. So there is this idea that I, I put in the blurb for this session. A good name is more than a label. A good name should change the way the reader thinks. Okay, so often when we discuss good naming conventions, it's like we're discussing conventions for labeling. That's not what it's about. You're actually you're trying to plant the seed of an idea, you're trying to influence the reader very strongly uh, uh, towards a, a model-based view of how they want to reason about the code. Um, as I said, I, I talk about this one quite a lot. Somebody, a um, couple of years uh, after I first started uh, talking about Philippe Calzado's uh, uh, technique, actually applied it um, to his own code. Um, it was a gaming company, it's a C-sharp code, and uh, this is really interesting. I mean, look at the size of public, Whew. huge. It's enormous, and you know there's still kind of the kind of the, the string list equivalents, game object and vector three. But here, the things that stand out for me, not apart from the public, void is enormous. That tells me we've got a lot of methods that are in some way very very imperative. We're saying do this, do that, do something. Also of extreme interest is bool, false, true. Else, if you're looking for if, you won't find it. Wordle knocks out anything two letters and shorter. This is very flag-driven code. Very flag-driven. In fact, if we look over here, we see case gets to be featured. It's like we've got a very kind of switch case if, else, this flag, set this flag, do this, which involves setting a flag and do that. It seems there's a lot of state going on, but we're not expressing it through polymorphism and delegates. We're kind of expressing it through if, else, if, else, ifs and switch cases. So there's kind of something going on here. So with this idea of losing, you know, sometimes we mechanize the names a little bit too much. Uh, Gregor Hopper has this uh, piece about convenience is not an illity. Parser.process nodes, text, comma, false. What's the false mean? I understand what text is. I've got a pretty good idea about parser and process nodes, but false is a mystery. But it's a really strong habit that when we have two choices, one way or the other, that we say, oh, I know conveniently enough, in the language there is a primitive concept that has only two values. We'll use that one. But from the outside, you look at it, it's going, oh, I don't know what that means. Perhaps an enum, or alternatively, if it's actually two variants, and in many cases, 
this is what's going on. It's two variations of behavior. And actually, when you look at it, the, the review I did last week, really interesting, there were two things that were bullified. And you went in, and you realized where the bull was used. And it was, if true, then behave in this way, else behave in a completely and utterly different way, which is not even remotely related to this other case. <laughs> in other words, these two don't belong together. This is actually what's called control coupling. It's like I'm on the outside, and I know there's two implementations, and I say, I want that one, please. Well, if there's two, if there's two different purposes, then, then maybe we have a name for it. Yeah? Process nodes with logging, or process nodes with whatever it is that we're enabling. So make it explicit at that level. This is an opportunity for you to name. If you ever come across, I mean, the most extreme case I came across was, um, was a, a method that had five Boolean arguments. On the inside, it looked okay, because they were all really well named, if is enabled and stuff like that. On the outside, false, false, true, true, false. What does that mean? You have no idea. This could be line noise. So this gets us to the question that we've found a need for our names. We've found a need for communication. But then we start overcompensating. We kind of go into that kind of Shakespeare territory. And we start, and our most simple model for creating names is to glue bits together, because this is one of the things that names are pretty good at. It's a process in, um, in linguistics called agglutination. Complex words are formed by stringing together morphemes, each with a single grammatical or semantic meaning. Languages that use agglutination widely are called agglutinative languages in what can only be described as a fit of originality. Um, and so uh, English has this a bit. Uh, it's, uh, all Germanic languages have this, so English has it. Um, Dutch has it. Uh, uh, the Nordic languages have it. Um, but German has it in spades. You know, there's, there's, it's, uh, uh, you know, you, where most people would be satisfied with a sentence, a German can normally coin a word. Um, so here's some interesting examples. Um, this is technically the longest word in the English language without hitting uh, Joyce territory. Um, the great irony of this is that it's actually completely composed of Greek and Latin parts. No, there's no English parts there at all. Uh, it's kind of pneumatic. It's a supplementary condition that you can get through um, breathing in uh, dust or sand-based uh, things. It's a completely made-up word. It was made up to be the longest word. On the other hand, if you're Norwegian, you may have to encounter one of these. I'm not even going to try to pronounce this. <laughs> I've had a go at a couple of times, but it's one of those ones that if you're not a native speaker, you've really got to take a run up and figure out where the jumps are. You know, figure out, oh, I need to pause there and then move on there. Uh, I'm absolutely, but of course, as I said, <laughs> Nordic language is pretty good on this. Nothing compared to German. That is, is or was the longest word in German. 64, 65 letters. It, re it relates to an EU directive, which is no longer in force. So there's a question is, is this still a word? Because the thing it refers to no longer exists. Its abbreviation is 12 letters long. If you happen to speak German, I, you know, if you can find, you find a German speaker near you, just get the right cadence and, and go for it. It's natural if you've been doing German for decades. But uh, for the rest of us who merely have menu-level German, it's quite a challenge. Sadly, we take this into the code. And we start using standard parts. There's a whole load of things. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a service. Oh, yeah. OK, we'll add the word service on there. Of course it's a service. That's the whole point of software development. You are, you, this piece of code provides a service for something else. But you no, know, it really is a service, because it provides a service over the network, in which case it's still a service and it's still software. But what about this service within the process? That's also a service. Well, yes, it's all services. So the problem here is that. Um, it doesn't really mean anything. We've got all these extra bits and pieces that we add in to help. So we'll, we'll tackle a couple of these. By the way, if you're ever struggling, this is a web page from Jeff Foster, methodnamer.com. You can just go and generate, just refresh the screen. Give me another name, give me another name. Abstract customer singleton, fantastic. Copy, paste, code. <laughs> yeah, you, and even better, you get to choose. You get to choose your different naming Styles. Oh, my first method name is like Spring Framework style, JDK style. You know, I can, I can go through this. And there's classnamer.com. You can do the whole thing. I'm still waiting for variablenamer.com. And then my, my, my work here is complete, because we can then create a service that automatically creates a program for you. 
Yeah, I just, I'll just hook it up. It'll be like a glorified Twitter app, and it's going to write some enterprise application for you. We'll take our variable names from there, our method names from there, and our class names from there. Brilliant. Okay, and just get a programmer involved every now and then to put an ear for a while in, you know, just for, for good measure. Obviously, we need to do a little bit better than this. A good name should describe structure with intention. That's its role. Don't, just, don't tell me what I'm looking at that I can already tell. Don't tell me stuff about the language. Tell me something about the intention. Why is this here? I want to know what role it plays, what part it plays, as opposed to the affix-heavy approach common to many naming conventions in current use. You get the addition of prefixes and su suffixes becomes homeopathic. You end up diluting the meaning till there is nothing left. This name is so descriptive, it actually means nothing. Which leads us to the conclusion that good naming is part of good design. So this is a, it's a contrived example based on fairly typical enterprise type code. I could have gone further, but I wanted to keep the font at the right size so I didn't have to do too much line wrapping. This is all interfaces. We've got a book entity. So imagine we've got some kind of simple catalog. Okay, we're going to put books in the catalog. And they've got ISBNs. Uh, book entity, yep, because that tells us that it's an entity. That's very helpful. I wouldn't have known that otherwise. I mean, book is an obvious idea. I could not have guessed. It is a kind of thing that I'm interested in referring to. And if, where do I get my books from? Well, you know, you could create them or you could use a factory. That's how you do things properly. You're not allowed to use the new keyword. No, no, you need to write a whole class to wrap up new. And uh, how do we know our ISBNs, international standard book numbers? They have a rule of well-formedness. How do I know that they're valid? We need a validator. Yeah. It's just... And we've got a repository, and then we've got a repository provider. And you know, in fact, I could go further. We could have a processor, probably. That's probably needed somewhere. I've overlooked that. Um, because obviously, you want to be able to add books. So maybe I need an add book processor. Or maybe that's an add book controller. Or maybe both. Why take one into the shower when you can have both? And that's just the interfaces. There's the implementations. Because obviously, you know, if you're going to have an abstract book entity, implementing book entity, then you need to tell people that it's abstract because the abstract keyword is not clear enough. Um, and nor is the compiler error that you get when you try to instantiate an abstract class. No, these are not strong enough clues. We really, really need to pour it on thick for the reader. And so you get some outstanding, yeah, we go catalog repository provider impulse. It's just, yeah. But inside this, there is a tiny little model that's trying to get out. It's not very large. We've got books. We've got ISBNs. If you want an ISBN, it's not a string that has been validated. An ISBN is a type of thing. And that kind of, we've got a technical word for thing. I talked about thing earlier. Object, that's it. Oh, wow. Moment of enlightenment. We could have a class for ISBNs. And what would that class be responsible for? Well, maybe we could move the validation somewhere else, or it could validate so that all the ISBN-ness is in one place. Whoa, you know, this is quite profound. And we've got a catalog. And the ISBN's just a value type, so just go and make it a final class. So, yeah, fine. And then, I guess, we need to start implementing things. Now, I put that name in description of catalog implementation, not because that's a good name, it's in italics, to say what, what the role, what the name should be. Tell me about the nature of the implementation. And then perhaps that deals with other bits and pieces. But the point here is at this level, from the usage perspective, I've actually got a very small model. Now, it might actually go back a long way. There might be other components here, but we push them out backwards. We don't splat them out sideways so that you know, we give people a kind of full frontal assault. Yes, we've made your life easier. We're going to use um, dependency injection, and we've made every interface totally visible at every single level. And to make your life easier, you're going to have to configure this using XML. Which bit of easy are we struggling with? It's a really simple concept. An object is responsible for its own implementation. If you need to pass something in, find out what that thing is. Don't make it an artifact that is driven by these other technical decisions that kind of kick the encapsulation and intrinsic layering of your model out sideways. So back to Ken. And particularly, I want to talk about the idea of the um, hierarchy naming, or, well, we'll get to the hierarchy naming, but one of the elements he, he focuses on. One way to name classes is to give each a unique name, indicative of its purpose. 
That's kind of one of those obvious things, but well, yes, that makes sense. Unique names give you the opportunity to convey a lot of information without creating names that are long and unwieldy. In many cases, we have a name that's good. You know, this is exactly the right thing to do if the names are in common use. Okay, so, so go for it. Um, so, simple example. Um, so let's try something else with books. Let's create a, a library, because library models are very frequently used in workshops. Um, in fact, I still use them uh, in training workshops. Uh, I remember working at a colleague a few years ago. He said, oh, Kevlin, you should stop using library examples, because I remember doing library examples in university in the 1980s. And you know, I've seen books that use the library example going back to the 1970s, stuff like that. He says, you know, Kevlin, you need to really get with it. You know, you've got to have a video rental store. Well, I claim I won. <laughs> OK, libraries are stable by comparison with video rental stores. So what have we got? Let's just focus on one aspect here. Let's focus on a simple relationship between a member and a book copy. That relationship is called a loan. OK, I've chosen, already chosen the simplest names possible. Sometimes when I've run this, I've ended up with loan record. No, loan, that's, that's pretty straightforward. English. Um, I have clarified book, though, because there is a distinction. There is an ambiguity in the terminology of book. It turns out you, you need to add enough to disambiguate things. So for example, um, when I talk about book, if I go to Amazon, and I say, all right, I'm going to buy a book. OK, I'm just, you know, somebody says, oh, what are you doing? I'm just looking at books. Well, you're not really looking at books. You're looking at book titles. That's what uh, publishers call them. Book titles, they're kind of the, the product, as it were. It's like the car model. The book copy is the thing that you actually comes through the post. In theory, at this point in time, I am helping to write a book. But I'm not writing a book copy. You know, Kevin, could you give me a copy of your, oh, yeah, hang on, let me just write it again. I'm writing the manuscript from which the book copy is actually ultimately produced under the aegis of the book title. They, in other words, the word book turns out to have different meanings depending on the context. And in natural human language, we've kind of, we're quite happy to play with this and go with this. But code needs to be a little crisper. So you don't borrow, you don't, you're not borrowing a, a book title, so to speak. You're borrowing a book copy, an actual physical thing. OK, now we may say, well, you know what, I, I feel the need to abstract a little bit. It's, it's very flat at this level. Perhaps um, you know, to create a more stable and partition model, I'm going to factor out. I'm going to introduce interfaces. I'll, there's a couple of things. That I'm not doing strict UML here. It's mostly correct UML. Um, so I'm going to have the actual member and actual book copy classes here. And loan is not going to see the concrete classes. I know. It's going to just define its relationship with respect to interfaces. What shall we call those interfaces? I, I, I. I member, I book copy. There you go. Problem solved. Yeah, it's quite obvious that there's a relationship between these. And yeah, we've solved the problem of actually having to think. This is a really lazy naming convention. You see it everywhere. And the problem is that many of the examples that we see this in, other, people learn from example, not explicitly, implicitly. If you're exposed to certain kinds of coding habits and certain kinds of coding conventions, don't be surprised when those turn up in your code, because you know, it's, if you've got kids, you'll notice your speech patterns turning up in your kids. Okay? So it's natural. We are, we're good at copying. Right? We don't even know we're doing it. But if you pause for a moment and think, hang on, I've not really said anything useful here. I've not actually added anything. I've just kind of skirted around the issue. because. If you look at it, what we've ended up doing is, I mean, we've, we've certainly aligned these things. It's like, okay, there's a membership hierarchy, there's a book copy hierarchy, but we've aligned it like that, and we may even package it like that, but it turns out that's completely the wrong way of looking at it. The way you want to look at it is like this. It's about the loan relationships. It's, not a, you, it's very difficult to understand how a class hierarchy should be named unless you understand how it's used. So this is one of the things I, I always despair of and why certain conventions for class hierarchy design, not just the naming, um, have never made sense to me because they normally have this, this drawing of a class hierarchy and there's no code using it. How can I tell what the good names are and what the good methods should be if nobody shows me how it's been used? And it turns out that object orientation 
curiously enough, is not really about the object. It's about the interactions. It's about the relationship. So it doesn't really make sense to talk about that as being I member and I book up, because in the point of view of a loan, we want to focus on the roles. You have to take a very object-centric view. Now, a technique that I learned many years ago, and I actually found the source of this uh, a couple of years ago, is imagine yourself inside an object. Instead of the privileged perspective you get as a developer, and by privileged, you, you have a privileged perspective, you can see inside classes. You can kind of move through the whole code base as if you were moving through the plans of a building. You can see it from above. But when you actually experience a building, you have to walk through it room at a time. It looks, this building looks very different when you look at the plan view than the experience of walking through it. So you need to do that for your code. Put yourself in an object. What can you see? Why is that object over there? Why do you have a relationship to that object? Why do you have a reference to it? What role, what does it mean to you? Is its membership important? No, it's the role. A part in a play or film, well, not quite. A person or thing's function in a particular situation, that's meaningful. A function, part, or expected behavior performed in a particular operation or process. So tell, let me focus on the role. Now, when we take a role-based perspective, this becomes a lot easier. A loan, in other words, it's not about the hierarchies. A loan is nothing to do with class hierarchies. A loan is an arrangement between a borrower and a loan item. Sadly, English doesn't have a very good term for the right-hand side, so I'm going to have to put the item in there. Occasionally, people sort of put loanable, but that's not that much better, and borrowable is actually quite difficult to say. So loan item is, is a reasonable compromise. But in other words, what we've just done there is we have encapsulated the essence and correctly aligned. It's not, to do, not vertically aligned, it's horizontally aligned. A loan is a relationship between a borrower and a loan item. When you're capturing the essence of something, we have a, there is a word for that. It's called abstraction. Abstraction is that. You are removing all the stuff that doesn't matter. And what is interesting is that if we just left borrower as I member, if we just left borrower as I member, the chances are it would have a whole load of methods that make no sense from the loan perspective. It would probably have, it would have names that relate to being a member, such as the membership number, such as the name and the address and other things. But that's not important. If, I, if I'm going to be a borrower, then I need to be able to attach a loan and detach a loan. If I'm going to be a loan item, the book title is not important, nor is the ISBN number. But whether or not I'm available, that turns out to be supremely important. So what is interesting here is that you actually end up with a narrower interface, because borrower doesn't need these names, these other features. So the name I member actually causes you to put more code in. It increases the coupling of your code. You end up with a wider method interface. The borrow interface is intrinsically narrower. Now, of course, if you are feeling a little uncomfortable and going like, oh, I really, I'm not comfortable with the, the, the sort of this, the idea there, and you want to put interface back in, feel free, but you want to put the I there, but I'm, 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 my instinct, you know, I don't worry about it quite as much. But I, I generally, when people have a choice on this one, I, I do try to influence them away from putting the I keyword in, because it turns out that interface, even not when it's not presented in shocking yellow on shocking pink, is normally quite visible within your code. How on earth will I know that this thing is an interface? Could it be the interface keyword in front of it? I don't know. So I'm just going to give that as a consideration. Feel free to put the I back in. And if you have an I-based convention, feel free to stick with it. But I would urge you, if you're using it, whenever you are making a name choice, consider stripping out the I's and making sure your names are unique. You know, identify the roles and then put the I thing back in. I have heard there's a sort of a, a very anthropomorphic naming convention which hasn't really caught on. I think it's kind of interesting as an experiment. I personally don't go for it, but I do invite people to experiment with it that kind of emphasizes the role thing and takes advantage. If you're using English names in your code, then you can take advantage of, you know, you know, I am borrowing or I am loanable or, you know, stuff like that. You can actually use the I constructively in the name. I think it's a little cute, but, you know, your mileage may vary. Feel free to experiment. So let's try another example. This is a workshop example, uh, actually, all the way through to code that I used, uh, used with one group. Let me just uh, sort of distill the essence of it. You've got a parser, so I'll jump into part of the design. 
there is a parser that takes some input, you know, JSON or something like that. There is a builder, and you're gonna tell the builder, look, I'm building a parse tree. So you tell the parser sends events to the builder, the builder builds a tree, and you get uh, uh, the resulting tree from that. Brilliant. Now, you might feel, oh, okay, I need to decouple this a little bit, so maybe I'm gonna do this. Now, we've been forewarned about the I prefix problem, so we've got a solution. Oh, yes. There you go, that's so much better. I'm gonna put impl on the end. So I'm gonna keep, you keep the good name for the interface, and then put impl. It's just like, uh, this is kind of the same problem but the other way up. Because we're still emphasizing builder, builder, impl. And that relationship doesn't really tell us what's going on. Let's try this one again. Let's try a horizontal view. From the point of view of the parser, is it a builder? Well, no, I'm sending events to it. Look, I've just encountered the beginning of a sequence. Look, I've just encountered an integer literal. Look, I've just encountered a string literal. It's an event handler. So perhaps parser listener or parser event handler or something like that. But the idea is that look at it from the parser's point of view. That interface, as a friend of mine used to call it, an outer face, this is kind of two-part contract. You want to use me, you call these methods, but you have to look like this, and I will call back on you. So what is it from the parser's point of view? It's nothing to do with building. In fact, curiously enough, from the parser's point of view, the parse tree is actually irrelevant because we've just outsourced the problem. We've got a parser, we send parser events to the parser list. Now, we don't know what it does with it, which is exactly what a, a good decoupled design should look like. This piece of code should have no idea nor any care of what another piece of code does. It should be quite selfish about things. I'm just sending you events. What you do with them is entirely up to you. You can mock them. Um, uh, uh, you can build parse trees. Your problem, not mine. And when we look at it, we realize, why is the tree still dependent? Why is that being referred to in the interface? You know, there may be something like a get resulting tree type method. There you go. That's because it's nothing to do with it. The fact that we're using a build, we're plugging in a builder to an event sequence, the fact that we're plugging in a builder in order to produce a tree is none of, parser, none of the parser's concern. Why should it have to care, uh, care about this? You just plug it in, let it go. So here's the interesting thing, is once you start shifting the names, it turns out that you start shifting the design, and the design shifts into the direction of narrower interfaces with less coupling. Names actually have an architectural impact in the long term. Now, sometimes when you're organizing a hierarchy, you can't get all of this right, so maybe you need to use a qualified subclass name. You can communicate how the new class, the new subclass, is the same by naming some superclass. It need not be the immediate superclass. If some distant ancestor communicates more clearly, you can communicate how the new class is different by finding a word that accurately highlights the reason the new class isn't just the superclass. So this gives us a kind of compound name, but we have a compound name with motivation. So we imagine we've got something like this. We've got a connection from which we're getting some kind of data. Where do you get your connections from? You get them from a connection factory, of course. I don't know, maybe we should use a shop metaphor. You know, maybe because that's where you really get things from. You know, people don't go to the source these days. You get them from a shop. No. However, Connection Factory produces connections which are implemented using connection impl. Hmm. Let's try this one again. Let's be more specific. Perhaps what is that you have to ask yourself, what is the defining characteristic? It's very, very rare that you ever want a factory called factory. In other words, a factory is a role that you attach, in most cases, to an existing class. So for example, in Java, there is a collection interface. There is a collection hierarchy. If I want to iterate over a collection, then I ask for an iterator, and it produces an iterator. Yeah, this is really obvious. You know, I, I go up to something like a linked list, and I say, hey, give me an iterator, and it gives me an iterator. And yet, I don't use the word factory anywhere. A collection is an iterator factory. It doesn't matter that it doesn't have it in its name. It is an iterator factory. A factory always has been and always will be. A factory is a role that it plays. It's not a naming convention. It's a role that it plays. So what is the thing that you really want to communicate? It's not that it's a factory. Perhaps we've got a connection pool. Perhaps there's something else. But I'm going to focus on it's a connection pool. That's what makes it interesting. It's not a connection factory that happens to pull. It's a connection pool. That's the most important thing. Right. We've got a connection, that's our interface, so we've got a good name for the interface, we keep that, and therefore, by definition, the implementation that we're interested in is a pooled connection. That's what makes this connection interesting. So we use this qualified approach. So we've got this idea of either using distinct names 
um, and role-based naming or a qualified approach. And these two pretty much give you, you know, most class and interface names that you're ever going to need. Let's, let's go into the connection pool. How might we write this? Our habits go all the way to argument names and, uh, and uh, method names and exception names. Uh, Connection, create connection. It's very easy, you don't even have to think about it. Your, your fingers just reach for create connection. Provider, provider, that's a very common naming convention. In other words, you just name the variable after the class. It's kind of easy, especially if you use a case convention that allows you to do that. It's kind of like, yeah, it's easy, but it's not always the best thing. And when you're, when you're looking at it from the interface point of view, perhaps that you could be more expressive. And then throws connection, failure, exception. What's really going on here? This is a very, although there's nothing technically wrong with this description, it's lacking, it's lacking communication. I'm just taking Lego parts of names down from the shelf and putting them together and saying, here, I've got some code. Let's try this. Ah, right, connect to. That's what you're trying to do. You're creating a connection. Just as I don't say, I don't go to a collection and say, create me an iterator, dear collection. I say iterator. That's just straightforward in that case. We could actually even choose some other names with, with hindsight. But here, connect to. It's very intentional. This, connect to that. It's a provider. Provider of what? Of updates. You can do what you want with those um, uh, argument names because they're not, they don't have any role outside. They're just living documentation. And then throws connection failure. Oh, my God. I haven't put the word exception on the end. And occasionally this gets people kind of upset or hot under the collar, and I mentioned this in a session here last year and had a very extended discussion outside, um, which uh, is probably, um, and that might have been prefixed, but you know, I did, did this back in uh, uh, February last year. Today's defiance, writing exceptions whose names don't end with exception. Result, names shorter and more exception like sky hasn't fallen, a revelation. Let's look at this. Such a habit, you don't even know you're doing it. It's such a habit I didn't know I was doing. I found myself writing this one day and thought, why am I putting exception on the end? Of course, you can't change it for things that are already there and given in third-party libraries, but there's no reason you should continue like this. Nobody requires it. And if they do, they shouldn't. Let's look. So I went into the .NET libraries and dug, dug this out. Here are some things that you can find in the uh, system namespace. Access violation exception, argument out of range exception, array type mismatch exception, bad image format exception, cannot upload app domain exception, entry point not found exception, index out of range exception, invalid operation exception, overflow exception. Let's just try taking the exception word off the end. Oh, these are actually quite good names. There's no mystery as to what their role is in the code. I mean, you know, they inherit from exception uh, they're used in throw statements and catch clauses, what could they possibly be? I have no idea. It's a mystery to me, especially with names like access violation. I have no idea whether that's a bad thing. What, the word violation? Argument out of range, that's obviously a positive thing. No, it isn't. Array type mismatch. The word mismatch is, already tells you this is not good. Bad image format. You know, you got me stumped there. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? No, it's bad. Cannot unload app domain. There is nothing about that that says this is good. Okay, entry point not found. Oh, yeah. You are looking at sort of despondency, index out of range, invalid operation. All of these things, when you look at them, you suddenly realize, actually, these are quite good names. But we've, we've kind of taken away the goodness of the name by saying it's an exception about this. Well, of course, it's an, it, actually, it's not an exception about an access violation. It is an access violation that is being signaled. People look at, the, forget the purpose of exception handling, or the role there, is to signal something. And so therefore, describe the signal. Tell me what, what is going on. And there's no need to put the extra word on there, especially such a long word. It turns out these are already pretty good. Now, you might say, OK, look, you've, you've cherry-picked. You've gone through the system namespace, and you've cherry-picked, Kevin, because here's a bunch of other ones. OK? Argument exception, arithmetic exception, context martial exception, yeah. Yeah, you see what happens when I take the exception suffix off? See? Argument, arithmetic, context martial, field access, format, null reference, object disposed, rank, type access. You see, these names, they need exception. No, they don't. 
They were bad names to start with. Putting exception was a panic button response. These names suck. They don't tell you what's going on. Argument exception. Arithmetic exception. Any clues? Something to do with arithmetic, but you know. Null reference. What could that possibly mean? I mean, we've, we've got so used to it that we forget that this is actually meaningless. There, there's nothing wrong with having a null reference. If I have a reference, it can be null. That's the whole point. Look at the language definition. It's perfectly acceptable. You can't have an exception that says you've got a null reference. That's really not very kind. So in other words, the problem is that these are actually bad names. Putting exception is just, you know, kind of like a plaster on it. That's it. It doesn't really help. Let's try that again. <sighs> My God, what, look at that. Invalid argument. Suddenly I've communicated what's really the problem. It's an invalid, it's nothing to do with arguments being exceptional. It's to do with the fact it's invalid. Ah, and that's an invalid arithmetic operation. And it's a failed context marshal and an invalid field access and an invalid format. And the problem with null was not that you had one, but that you dereferenced it. And so on and so on. These are names are describing the situation. It's how you would name an event. Tell me the event that's going on. It's a bad event because it's an exception, but use an event-based name. And feel free to be descriptive. You know, we've all got, you know, dictionaries are easy to find. So, as Strunk and White in the original Elements of Star said, you know, omit needless words. You don't need all these extra noise. You, the reader already has an awful lot to look at. Don't, don't labor them with stuff, particularly it turns out that when you put in certain things and they, they, there's repeating patterns, human beings have a thing that they do with repeating patterns. They tune them out. It's a, there's very good evolutionary reasons for this, but you tune them out. Once you see lots of repeating parts, you stop seeing them after a while. It's, um, there was a recent study actually about uh, 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 warning dialogue boxes. It turns out that after the first, you know, if you keep exposing people to what they actually tune out, they do it automatically, they don't even know they're doing it. It's like end user license agreements. You know? It's just like, I, I, it's just like, you don't even know, yeah, I accept, you know, oh, it's a box. <laughs> or I'm trying to use this service, why is it not? Oh, because there's a little red thing saying you haven't ticked this. What are you going to do? Read the end user license agreement? Of course not. Come on, click, done. Well, this is the problem. We tune this stuff out, we don't even know we're doing it. So when you start filling, the names with noise and parts that we tune out, they, li they lose their significance. Uh, that's an exception, that's an object, that's a manager. If you start making all the names like this, before long you kind of think, well, hang on, what was I looking at again? And then uh, this is the problem, it's become so familiar, it's lost its original power. Oh yes, get. So I quite like, kind of language things. So I have a copy of the Oxford English Dictionary on my laptop because the physical version, I think they've actually stopped selling it and keeping it up to date because it's so ridiculously uh, forest destroying. Um, but, you know, it's got, you know, the better part of a million words and it's, just to clarify, as, unless you are a language geek, you definitely don't want to get the OED because if you're looking for a dictionary that will help you with help you with usage, it won't, but by God, it'll give you the history of it. Because this is cognate, get, the word get, cognate with the Old Norse, and middle period Swedish, and this is really useful stuff. Yeah, I mean, this is gonna affect your day-to-day -day usage of the, I mean, you get the complete history. And the first entry is never the most common usage, which is a usage-based dictionary, it's typically the earliest historical. So you'll get the current stuff is always at the end. So this is not a dictionary of usage, but if you are into, if you're a language junkie, then I strongly recommend this. It's fantastic. You know, you've got the English language going back to the first millennium. It's, it's great. And now, the thing I would like to draw your attention to is on the left-hand side, you see get, and there are four head entries for get. And on the right, I would like you to draw your attention to the size of the scroll bar. Yes, it is proportionate. It turns out that get is one of the two words with the longest entry in the OED. And the second one is set. <laughs> Draw your attention to that. 
Uh, and it's nice to know about the relationship to Old Frisian, which I think is essential in our day-to-day -day usage of the term set. Now, I'm picking on these guys because they, they, they get used together. They have, there's this accident that happened in English. There is this coincidence. Get and set are almost the same. They sound similar. They have euphony. They rhyme, get, set. They're spelt kind of two-thirds the same. Fantastic. I, can, I don't have to worry about conserving vowels. You know, there's only one in there, and it's the same one. That's fantastic. Get and set. And they, they're the same length. Now, for people who work with monospace fonts, namely programmers, there are a few freakish programmers who do not use monospace fonts. We don't talk about them. <laughs> um, it lines up really nicely. So yeah, this is alignment. Alignment matters in code readability. This is nice. They line up, get and set. They rhyme. And they're kind of opposites, except they're not. You see, the opposite of set is reset or unset. The opposite of set is not get. Get is just a query. And there is a problem, actually. There is an ambiguity. When we talk about the word get, when we use the word get, there is, is get a, does it have a side effect or not? Or is it a pure query? Well, that's kind of interesting. Because it's not entirely clear. Because sometimes it is. And you actually go through, if you go through a series of libraries, what you'll find is that in most cases, get indicates a query. But in some cases, it actually indicates something with a side effect. If we actually look at everyday usage of the term, then we discover that actually get in English means has a side effect. Let me pick a couple of examples. I have a wedding ring. Do you know what that means? It means that once upon a time, I was not married. And then I was. And what happened? I got married. Ah, when you get married, there is a side effect. There is a fundamental state change in your life. No, it's not merely a query. It's actually quite profound. If I go to the cash machine and I get money from my bank account, disappointingly, my bank balance goes down. I would love that to be a pure query. Get means has huge, great side effect. That's what it means. So the problem is we're kind of misusing the language as well. We're just, we're just adding noise. So if we look, you know, I've got, given that we're talking about money, let's imagine, you know, most money, most monetary systems these days break down into a very simple model. You know, you've got a currency, you've got units, and you've got hundreds. Get units, get hundreds, get currency. And there is a problem that we follow through without really thinking about it because the associations, it feels very, very natural. I've got a getter, I put in a setter. You don't even think about it. Set units, set hundreds. Well, this is not how we should do this. Now, I did a whole talk on more um, uh, functional thinking and the use of immutability. So the first thing I'm going to do is like, no, it's a proper value class. It's shareable. It's immutable. Fine. Done. Let's get rid of the setters. So we can get rid of that. I'm not saying you should never have a thing called set. I'm just saying that if, uh, if we reach for that as our default, in other words, if we do that without thinking, then often it ends up all over the place. It loses its potence. Sometimes I do want to use the word set, and I really want to mean it in some way. And then we get get units, get hundreds, get currency. Now, is there anything here that is, you know, am I getting any better than if I do that? Well, no, because these are just queries. I've also got a slight problem. This goes back a long, long way, is that I, I am concerned that this reliance on this kind of imperative language is actually stopping people thinking in a non-imperative way, because get is a very imperative name. It's telling the machine that I'm going to go somewhere to a field and get a value. Just ask for the value. What are the units of this? What are the hundreds? What's the currency? It turns out that it's, um, it doesn't really break people's brains when you do this. So uh, this is, and this is, we can't blame, we can't blame um, uh, uh, .NET or, um, uh, or Java or uh, you know, anybody for this, because I found an article that I wrote 20 years ago where I was already complaining of this. Um, and I'd seen it in a lot of codes, just like, oh, this is lazy naming. You just got to name directly. So, Kind of to um, sort of bring things to a kind of considered close. Well, not quite close, but I just want to, uh, on the get thing, I just want to consider some of these names and what they tell us. <laughs> and the uh, embarrassment. Get length. You know, I used to get a lot of spam that suggested that. 
not good. Thanks. Get position index. It seems very explicit. Notice that when these names get long, it's never because people are trying to obscure something. You know, the point is that people don't set out. When you're writing your code, you're just following through, and the thoughts come to you, and they flow out of your fingers, and based on habits and things that you see around you. This is very, very natural. But it's also one of the reasons that we don't write code in ink, because there is this idea of like, oh, actually, that's not such a good name. Now I think about it. You know, they might just, oh, yeah. Index off. Ah, yes. Yeah, we should, so there's that. Now, obviously, there are other bits and pieces where you can kind of say, ah, right, OK, look, I've got this object has a list, and now I'm going to ask it for its internal list. And the replace correct name for this is nothing, because you don't want to do that. You're violating encapsulation. OK, this is the problem. What we start getting into this, oh, I'm getting the feel, I'm getting the feel, I'm getting the feel. It's like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. That's the private collection. You're going to give somebody the private collection that you have you have got custody over, that you have curated carefully so that nonsense doesn't get into it, and you're just going to give them a reference to the underlying collection so they can put anything they want in it, and when you decide, you know what, that list wasn't such a smart idea. What I meant to use was some kind of dictionary or map type. Oh, now we've hard-coded it. Oops. Perhaps I shouldn't have given away the private sections. Coupling through collections is a very, very common problem. It's also an indicator of anemic domain models. You know, you, your code's not really doing anything because it's probably sitting in a controller or processor over there. But actually, we're just, it's just shuffling collections of things around. It's just like, wait a minute, let's give it a bit of life. What does it actually do? Get instance. Oh, we've got a singleton. We know what to do with singletons. There we go. Done. OK? So names, very, very useful um, when you start thinking about them. You should always go back to a name. Your first draft is never going to be enough. This is one of the most important things um, that we learn in coding. But actually, again, I'm going to go back to writing. It's one of the most important things you learn in writing. And there's, there are, um, I think it was Elmore James that said, um, you know, writing is rewriting. That is the thing that you do. It's not merely just the first moment. It's that's your first draft. You go back and you look at that and you go, oh, what I'm really trying to say is, and you express that. Now, I made a throwaway comment earlier on that naming has architectural implications. That's not always obvious. I mean, we've started seeing how actually it will influence the thinking of your design. It'll influence the number of things that you put in there. And what we find in almost every single case is that when you get your names right, interfaces get narrower, they get sharper, they get more precise. Whereas sometimes it feels like interfaces to objects are, are quite wide. It's kind of like that's our first thought. We're kind of you know, sort of uh, brainstorming aloud into the, into the method interface. And then you start thinking and you sharpen it down. You know what? That doesn't really belong there. And you move it out. And you've got a sharper idea. And you sharpen it. And it's precise. It, and the consequence is that it reduces the coupling and it often reduces the code, the amount of code. So this rather nice book by Stuart Brand, um, How Buildings Learn, talks about how buildings actually get changed over time, how they effectively evolve in practice. And he has an illustration here based on, um, and this illustration, uh, it's used in uh, the big ball of mud paper uh, by um, Joe Yoder and Brian Foote. Uh, and the idea here is I'm not going to try and picture a six-layer architecture where every layer begins with S and it must look like a building. No. It's uh, based on an analysis originally from the architect Frank Duffy, who identified a four-layer model. Um, for kind of functional buildings, um, office buildings as opposed to residential buildings. And he noticed that there are these layers of change. There is the site on which a building is founded. This is the most stable. And then you have the load-bearing structure. This is the next most stable thing. In other words, it's less likely to change. You don't normally change the site of a building. Okay? And to change the site of a building means either it's experienced an earthquake or somebody has bought the building up brick for brick for historical significance and relocated it somewhere in the middle of Arizona. So the point there is the site is profoundly stable. The load-bearing structure is also very stable, but perhaps less so, maybe open to renovation and change and upgrades. Then you have the exterior skin, the facade of the building, um, which for office buildings is something like a 20 to 40 year cycle before it gets um, uh, revisited. Then you have the services, which are on a 5 to 15 year cycle, the lighting, um, the cabling the heating, the air con, all this kind of stuff. These, these, get, these shift. So you want to, uh, and then you have the actual space plan and the stuff within it, like the chairs. These are highly volatile. You know, those chairs were there earlier, but they're gone now. 
Okay, these can be changing on the, on the level of minutes and hours, and as opposed to decades or centuries. So there is this idea you want to organize a building in sympathy with these changes. Don't make it, don't put your fast changing services, uh, don't embed those in the slow changing skin, for example. So there is this idea of creating an architecture in sympathy. Now, we have a similar thing, although perhaps less visual in code. There are layers. There are things that change and are more stable than others. Um, there's the kind of like the soft center of the egg. There is the, uh, the private stuff within a method versus the public exterior of something, which perhaps moves a little more slowly. Um, and certainly when it hits public APIs, it moves more slowly. And the problem is when we approach a programming language, when we approach code, and you're looking at it in the editor, you know what? That code that's fast changing looks exactly the same as the code that's incredibly stable. It doesn't look, it's not differentiated as clearly as these physical things. So when you're just typing interface there, it doesn't look like this is an interface we need to take a little more care over because it's exactly the same syntax and parts of the language. Now, why does this make a difference? Well, this is why it makes a difference. I, I, I was always uncomfortable with um, Sun's um, package model, the Java package model. When Java sort of first sort of came out, and I remember reading about it, I thought, oh, this is pretty cool. There's a lot of really good ideas in this language um, in terms of simplifications and so on. But the package model bugged me. I mean, it was clearly sitting there being utterly buzzword compliant, riding the wave of, oh, everybody's getting into the internet. Yeah, you know, CGI script for the win. Um, that was the internet back then. But everybody was piggybacking on this. And so therefore, it seemed natural as a way of identifying a company. Why don't we use the internet name? What a cool idea. And it'll also cause Java programmers to use ridiculously deep directory structures. Uh, but I remember feeling uncomfortable with the idea at the time. But I was uncomfortable with it for a couple of reasons, but later realized, actually, the reason is architecture. Sun no longer exists, but there's a whole bunch of packages called package.com.sun. And how easily can you change these? It's, it's fixed. So it also tells us that our names, we need to take some care with them. Because you, know, you might be sitting there going, oh, hey, I'm not programming Java. It's not my problem. OK, just go and look for your company name or your product name in your code base. This happens a lot. People use namespaces and other structures that indicate the product name as it was at one point. And do you know what? Who controls the product name? It's not the people that code it. So therefore, don't choose a name that is outside the realm of your control that has nothing to do with you, the logic of your domain. How companies name themselves, how they merge and demerge is entirely arbitrary. It has nothing to do with the domain model, the code, or anything like that, or anything that you can influence directly unless you happen to own a startup. There is nothing there you can change. I, I always kind of muse that if, uh, if uh, you know, if we, if we look at the, the companies that were around in 1995 and 1996, how many of them are still around with the same name? I say one of my clients is Siemens. Back then, it was still Siemens Nixdorf. Yeah, so you have all these little bits and pieces. It turns out the company name is one of the first things to go. It changes. Companies merge and demerge. In fact, around that time, I was working for a company and uh, uh, I ended up working with this guy who, who, was ta who, who joined while I was there. And his CV had an impressive list of companies that he worked for in the last 10 years. Four companies. Actually, he'd had exactly the same desk. Okay? The company had been brought in different points, been sold off, been rebranded. But apparently, he'd worked for four different companies. Yeah? Don't name something that is stable which is something like the partitioning of your code, don't name something that is inherently more stable than the world around it on something that is highly volatile. Now, does that tell you what to name it? No, it just tells you what not to name it. So I'm not being totally helpful there, but it is identifying, it's an early warning signal. There is a certain irony that Josh Block, who used to work for Sun, uh, made this observation. Public APIs, like diamonds, are forever. Once you publish them, you're damned. You cannot change these things. It's so there is a, a sense in which there are things that look like good ideas, and we may adopt them, and we often do. And then you look back at it and go, yeah, that wasn't so smart. So as Martin Fowler notes, there's no problem changing a method name if you have access to all the code that calls it. Even if the method is public, as long as you can reach and change all the callers, you can rename the method. 
But the problem, only if the interface is being used by code you cannot find and change. So therefore, be really careful with these things. Because it turns out your refactoring tools will not help you when it comes to dealing with code that is, you've already published outside your um, boundary of control and trust, your, your initial team or your initial organization. Um, and he uses a different term. He says, when this happens, I say that an interface becomes a published interface. And that's a kind of different role, but it doesn't have a syntax. Which leaves us with Ralph Johnson's rather nice observation. Architecture is the decisions you wish you could get right early in a project, but that you are not necessarily more likely to get them right than any other. And this applies to names in many cases, but not in all cases. There is this idea of identify where the name is. And sometimes there is this kind of feedback between the names and the structures. So I'll leave you with some uh, uh, three basic uh, pieces of advice from a book on writing, The Observation Deck by uh, Naomi Apple. Choose the right name, get specific, eliminate words. Thank you very much. have a couple of minutes for questions, because I did intend to finish early, um, because it's kind of the last main conference day. Uh, but actually, there are, there are, we do, I normally take questions offline, but actually, for once, I can actually take them in the flesh, present. So are there any questions? Does anybody want to test the acoustics around here? It's, <laughs> it's funny what happens when you take the chairs away. They act as baffles. When you take the chairs away, suddenly, psh, yes. Gosh, see, Microsoft, just like last year. Microsoft tells you that's the style you should use. Absolutely. And, and a lot of the style cult rules or whatever. So we, do we just ignore style rules? Or really no, you just don't follow them blindly. Um, because lots of people come up with rules. Coming up with rules is really easy. Yeah? And, and sometimes, sometimes they have an appropriate level of repentance. One of the things that you'll find if you go through the .NET naming conventions is this glorious single statement. Do not use Hungarian notation. I say it's glorious because I had to, uh, I remember reading up on Hungarian notation, which just to be clear was a Microsoft guideline. So, okay, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> um, the point is they, they're making a guideline because they had to publish a book which had guidelines in it. And they want to make, you know, there's a certain idea that you want to make it consistent. But why is that guideline there? As I said, guidelines are cheap and easy, but they're not always good. They are not always well, they are not always well thought out. I mean, we get, them with, uh, we get them with spoken language. And there's all this nonsense about don't, you know, not ending sentences with prepositions and don't split infinitives. You know, that's how to speak proper. Well, actually, no, it isn't. These rules were made up because people were worried that English didn't actually have any distinctive grammar, so they made some up. And they made books, and they got people, they convinced people that this was real. No, it's perfectly acceptable to boldly go. <laughs> Where rules should be, you know, the point is that you need to understand why is this rule here? Don't just take the rule at face value. Why is it, what problem does this rule solve? Now, sometimes we may say, ah, right, okay, so this class, so in a Java context, this class is to be used as a Java bean. Ah, Right, it's used as a Java bean. I'm going to use gets and sets because that's actually part of the introspection protocol. I have a good reason to do that now. But unless it's going to be in that context, and people don't really use Java beans anymore, then why am I doing this? What, what, what purpose does it serve? So the idea is you need to work out why, why, is the, why is this there? And sometimes there is a good reason and although you might find it anomalous in other cases, there is a good reason to follow it here and go for that. But you need to scratch the surface of a guideline, find out why it's there. And it, sometimes there's a good reason. And sometimes, as is many, often the case with guidelines, it's just somebody's arbitrary preference. You know, and, the, and the problem is that exception serves no meaningful value at all in this context. And there are some names. I mean, I, I love the fact that if you use attribute, if you define an attribute, that Microsoft, it, the, 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 it'll tell you, yeah, you're supposed to put attribute in the name. And do you know how important attribute is? It's so important that they automatically drop it. They'll allow you to use the name without attribute. That's how important the word attribute is. It's not. In other words, what they've done is they've created, they've created a guideline, and then they've created a workaround for their guideline. Smart. That's how you keep programmers in business. So what I would say is um, guidelines, guidelines can help because 
they offer guidance, but the thing is that they can also guide you in completely the wrong direction. I refer you to Hungarian notation. I refer you to the Josh Block quote. I refer you to the fact that the Windows header files, if you're looking at it from a C perspective, have gone from 16 to 32 to 64 bit, and all the names are horribly wrong because they said, you know what, we're gonna hard code the bit sizes in all the names using Hungarian notation. Now, you know, they say, oh, well, we learned from that. No, we learned from that in the 1970s and 1980s. It was already a known problem. Yeah, so therefore, you have to scratch the surface, go beyond it, look at the reasons and maybe you will find that there is a sound reason to pursue it. In other cases, you'll go, ah, they're just talking through their hat. You know, somebody got bored and said, we need a convention for this, absolutely. Well, we could ask people to name exceptions as if they were bad things. That's a great idea. No, I'm vetoing that. We're gonna put exception on the end because they might not otherwise know it's an exception. And they can put what the hell they want in front of the word exception. Yeah. Okay, I am parodying it ever so slightly, but there is that idea that you know, that one has no value, but there are naming conventions that do have value. It's just not one of them. It doesn't work in reflection. It's not, it's not important. Yes? You were talking about the idea of, uh, when you were naming the interface, of looking at it from a classic point of view. Yes. What if that interface is being used by several different classes? How do you do that thing of looking from all their different points of view? Is it being used? for the same reason in the same way? Does it fulfill the same role? And are all, these, are all these usages, if you look at them, are they similar, in other words, you can identify, or are they mutually exclusive? Because sometimes that's the thing that you find. It's one of those things that I found in a lot of, going back, a lot of APIs for, for, for file IO, for example, you'd end up with a file, and what can you do with a file? You can read and write from it. You know the number of cases where you actually read and write to the same file is incredibly rare. People normally open a file for reading, and in another piece of code, they will open the file for writing. In other words, there are files we open for reading and files we open for writing. And occasionally, there are files we do actually read and write simultaneously on the same stream to. In other words, it turns out that there are two disjoint roles, and sometimes that's what you'll discover. If you so this is the idea, as a naming exercise, as a thought exercise, you sharpen it, you suddenly discover this piece of code is using the same underlying object, but actually from a completely different perspective to achieve a completely different thing. And actually, we have a name for that, and suddenly you discover you have a new interface. And it has half the things that were in the original, more aggregated interface, and you split it out, two different roles. So that idea of a role is, is very important, and you may find the kinds of relationships we have are kind of mutually exclusive roles, and an object, a single class, can implement two mutually exclusive roles. Um, so for example, I can have something that is a listener, but it's also it is some kind of event source. So from one point of view, it, we're just sending events to it, but it repropagates in a different sense. And that usage doesn't care about that usage, but it's the same object because it has the right information. So there is this idea a class can implement two mutually exclusive roles or independent roles. Sometimes the relationship between roles is that one role is an extension of another. And so therefore you get subtyping of, of, of the interfaces. So I would say, look at it from that point of view and you will either find, oh yeah, they've all got a role and I can now think of a name for it, or actually they're doing different things. And maybe we have names to describe those different things. Okay, yes. Oh, do you see that exceptions? You are drawn to it like a moth to a flame. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is the problem: is that the, who wrote these guidelines were written by human beings, okay? Where and these human beings are the, uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to say they're bad human beings because they're not, because they're just human beings like me who make mistakes about certain things every now and then, and occasionally have a good idea, or see other people having a good idea, and say, I'd rather, I'd rather do that than that. If you ask most people why they put, why something is in a guideline, you will find exactly as I said before, scratch the surface and go in there. And you'll discover that they have a kind of weird, they either have a really weird view of how things should be, or they're just following a habit that perhaps they've never had the opportunity to question. Yeah? So there is this idea uh, that we do very easily fall into habits without questioning them. That's, a, that's kind of part of being human. So there's actually very good reasons we fall into habits without having to 
uh, question them a lot of the time. But here in software, given that the stuff we're working with is not real, we need to be very, very careful about how we use the few tools at our disposal. Names are really too valuable to be left to casual guidelines. They become quite soulless after a while, and you eventually lose the meaning. The purpose of a name is not to follow a guideline. The purpose of a name is to communicate what's going on in the code. That is first and foremost. Within that space, there are probably conventions and consistencies that we can find. But if we are following conventions and consistencies at the expense of communication, then those conventions and consistencies are worth very little. They are holding us back rather than pushing us forward. Right, okay, I'm gonna call that time. Thank you very much. <laughs>